Commissioner's Court of Grimes County, Texas. It is this date, it is this time. We are at the County Annex at 114 West Buffington in Anderson, Texas. The meeting, agenda item number one, has been called to order. I would like to recognize our uh, auditor, Mary Nichols. I guess this is your last rodeo? Yes, sir. <laughs> and you don't have anything better to do on your last day than this? <clears throat> Well, I could be in there working. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, okay? All right. Uh, second item on the, or the second agenda item is discuss and review Blue Jay Solar Farm Project proposal for Grimes County. Uh, just introduction, commissioners, uh, Commissioner Mallet and myself have had uh, a meeting in the past with some folks on the Blue Jay Project. We had a Craig Adair and we had a Stephen Van Dyke. So those two gentlemen are joining us this morning uh, in order to uh, give us some insight on what the project is all about. Uh, they gave us some of the basic parameters. I think it's about a 1500 acre project. It's going to be, it's proposed to be, I don't want to assume anything, it's proposed to be up in the Iola area, which is Commissioner Mallet's precinct. So I appreciate everybody being here this morning, and um, I guess you folks, if you would like to share some of your thoughts with the commissioners and kind of bring them up to date where uh, we need to be to help make a decision of where we go, because this is all about tax abatement and the project itself. So. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Judge. And uh, this is a kind of a more extended version of the information that we went through before when we met. And I bought copies. Should be enough for, for everybody here. Is the print bigger? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a little bit bigger. A couple of them have too much information. It's a little small. Um, but uh, thank you very much for your time. My name is Craig Adair, and I'm a senior development manager with Open Road Renewables. And here with me today is... Stephen Van Dyke is a consultant of ours that uh, with Cummings Westlake, and uh, I'm going to go through most of the information about the project and the, the reason why we're here today, which is to, to request an abatement. And I have an application for an abatement that I'll be leaving with you today that has even more information than is here. Uh, and then uh, I'll let Stephen go through the specifics of the, the revenue projections for, for the project. But, um, so uh, thank you for your time. And um, as the judge said, we've had a few discussions with Commissioner Mallet and with the judge. And uh, this is uh, a proposed project that is now several years in the making. And uh, it's something that we're very excited about and we would love to partner with the county on. So I really appreciate your, your taking the time and calling a special meeting, especially when probably everybody has fatigue from budget season. So I'm impressed that everybody showed up this uh, morning. What I'd like to do for the efficiency of this meeting uh, is I would ask that uh, you go through your, your presentation. Commissioners, as he, they go through the presentation, if you happen to have a question at that point, uh, please please ask it. I see that we have some other folks from the, the public, and I don't know what everybody's position is on this, but I'd like you to go through your presentation. Commissioners, ask their questions as we go along, but then I'm going to give an opportunity for anybody that is here that has a, a, a desire to speak for or against what's being proposed, then I'm going to uh, ask for their input because that will help us in the decision-making process, okay? Also, we will not make a decision today whether we would allow an abatement or not because this is the workshop, and the next step would be if there is a desire for us to move forward on this, then we will put it on a regular uh, commissioner's court agenda, and it would be to discuss and take action. The action today is that we're going to listen to what you have to say and concerns from others that, that might be here, okay? okay. That plan sounds great to me, and um, you know, there's a lot of information here. The way I see this is this is the beginning of the conversation. And I'm going to get you as much information as I can today. And if you have questions that I can't answer today, I'll be back in touch with you. I'll leave my cards with everyone. But that also goes for members of the public. Um, I'm always available for a phone call or to meet with folks because I realize it's a new thing here in Grounds County and something that's exciting, but it's a big change. And so I want to make sure everybody has all the information 
that they need to, to decide what, what uh, we can do together here. And just a review of the governor's order 29 that when you're doing presentations to groups, if you have the social distancing, if you want to remove your mask, you're okay to do that. If you want to keep it on, you're okay to do that too. No, while well, I'm talking, I think it'd be easier for everybody right. if I take it off. These folks didn't even know you had a mustache. I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new feature from COVID. So. <laughs> I'm still getting used to it. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, Judge. Uh, so here on, on this second uh, slide are the topics that I want to cover. Uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about my company and, and who we are, uh, and then I want to talk about the proposed project itself, um, and then I want to talk about the benefits that they're uh, that we're bringing to the county, and then talk about the specifics of the abatement that we're requesting. And like I said, those additional details will be in the abatement application, which we'll leave with you today. Um, at the end of that uh, is a bunch of kind of basic information about household projects work, what goes into them. I don't need to go through that. It's, it's mainly for your information. If you have questions about that, I'm happy to, to go into that part as well. Um, open Road Renewables. Uh, we are a utility scale solar project development firm. Um, we are based in Austin and uh, we're a small company. We're about 12 folks um, but that have an outsized footprint in terms of experience in the market. Um, the, the folks that uh, founded my company mostly come out of two previous companies, uh, one called Pioneer Green Energy and the other uh, Sun Edison. And when you put the, the team together in terms of the number of projects that we've done, it's a lot of megawatts. We think of megawatts uh, really rather than number of projects, but it's a whole lot. And I put some of that information here for you so that you can see um, the projects that folks on my team have developed. Uh, we have projects, solar projects that are up and running in, in two states, California and uh, Maryland. We have a project that's about similar in size to this one that we're talking about doing here in Grimes County that's currently under construction in Ohio. And then we also have um, over 1,000 megawatts, over 1,300 megawatts actually of, of wind projects uh, that we developed here in Texas uh, in different parts of the state. Um, most of which are operating, uh, one of which is actually about to finish construction up in Limestone County. Um, we are privately funded by a company out of California called MAP Energy. Um, and MAP is a, a, a significant presence all around the country in investing in natural gas, wind, and solar. Uh, MAP has over two and a half billion dollars um, under management uh, and has been involved in every stage of, uh, like I said, wind, solar, and natural gas. They got their start in natural gas, and as the market has shifted towards renewables, are one of the more active investors in the renewable space in the country. And I, there's more information about MAP and, and their involvement uh, in the abatement application. Um, the proposed project is called Blue Jay Solar. Um, and you can see a, a map here on this next, pro next project. As the judge said, it's, it's uh, in Precinct 1, uh, just south of the town of Iola. Um, it's entirely located within the Iola School District. Um, the maximum project size, uh, and if, if we get our way uh, and are able to do what we would like, it will be very close to a 210 megawatt project. That's um, about a, I would call, middle of the fairway size project in Texas. There are bigger projects and smaller ones. That's about, I would say, a, a kind of average size in Texas. Um, the total area that we have under lease for the project is about 2,500 acres, a little bit north of that. But as the judge said, not all of that area would actually have equipment on it. Because you can't put equipment in floodplains and wetlands and uh, you need certain topographies. We expect around 1,500 acres of those 2,500 would actually have equipment on it for a project of this size. Um, there are 16 uh, landowners participating in the project. Like I said, that's mostly through long-term leases. Some landowners sign easements uh, to run buried electrical cables. Um, but uh, So it's about 16 folks involved in the project. Um, so the, these 16 folks, are they all agreeable to what you propose to them? We've had a company that's come through and expressed that uh, they're a privately owned concern, and, but they have eminent domain and therefore semi-forced people under uh, false pretenses to sign over or sign contracts. None of that's going on here. No, and I'm glad you bring that up. Um, we are not a public utility. Under Texas law, we do not have eminent domain powers. 
So every contract we enter into, whether it's a lease, whether it's an option to purchase someone's land, which we do occasionally, uh, or an easement to run a transmission line, it is entirely a voluntary transaction. We cannot compel someone uh, to sign a contract with us via eminent domain. So, okay. so yes, these 16 landowners are folks that we negotiated with and signed agreements with. Some of them are, are here today, actually. Um, different types of agreements to participate in the project. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the power would be delivered to the transmission system uh, at the Iola substation, which is a 138 kV substation, kind of at the north end of that map. Um, I'm sure Commissioner Mallet is familiar with it. It's right off of County Road 127, just south of uh, uh, 39 there. Um, and the schedule that uh, we are looking at would be to start construction on the project around the next summer. Uh, and it takes about a year. If everything goes well, you, you might be able to do it in about 10 months to build a project of this size and so that it would ideally be operational in May of 2022. Now, that's, that can change. There are a lot of factors uh, involved in the construction schedule, but that's the schedule that we're targeting. And right now, that looks feasible if everything uh, continues to fall in place. I'll move on from the project unless... Um, Why Blue Jay? <laughs> good, good question. Blue Jay, that's actually just because uh, you know, it's, a, it's a bird that's found a lot in Texas. Um, well, the state bird's mockingbird. <laughs> you're right, and actually that name was already taken. That, that was my first choice. <laughs> but somebody beat us to that, and so right. we settled on Blue Jay. Um, what's in the, the components that are involved in the solar project, and which would be the improvements that would come on the tax rolls that we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later, um, are the solar panels, obviously. Um, the solar panels sit on racks, which then uh, are mounted onto piles, which are direct driven into the ground. Uh, typically, no concrete foundations for those pilings where the, the panels sit. Um, and then the power runs from through cables along the back of the panels over to an inverter. Uh, the power at a solar panel is generated in direct current, DC, and then it's convert, converted at those inverters to alternating current, AC and then runs underground um, over to the substation and then from there on to the grid. So those are the main pieces of equipment listed there. Was, um, but kind of what we call the secondary components that you also see are the fencing, the roads, a pyranometer which just measures the solar irradiance at that specific location and then a monitoring building with SCADA equipment and, and other monitoring equipment and storm management features. Um, you, most of you are probably familiar, you've seen the, the project over near b uh, There's not a lot of variation. Solar projects are, are fairly standard, so it would look very similar to that. Um, it would just occupy, it would be larger, occupy more fields rather than a single field. And the other difference now is that there's kind of two different types of racking systems on the market. There's the fixed tilt, where the panels sit and face south. Um, the rows run east and west, and they just face at about a 45 degree angle south. Increasingly, and what we expect this project would have uh, is what we call single axis trackers, where the rows run north and south, and the panels are, are sitting on a rack with a motor that automatically rotates and follows the sun. So, in that sense, it would look a little bit different. Um, that produces more electricity, so it's higher production. They're more expensive, though, and so it's a calculation that we'll be doing, but more and more solar projects are, are going to those, and that's what we anticipate would be here. Um, okay, the, the heart of, I think, why we're, we're here today is... Um, did you mention stormwater management features? Yeah. You did? Yeah. What's that? You did mention that? Yeah. I missed it, I'm sorry. Yeah, and that's, and that's one that we can you know, talk more about. Like I said, some slides at the end that okay. have more details on each of these parts, and we can go into that if you like. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of what, what's involved in the project there. Um, this is an exciting opportunity to me for, for the county in terms of the benefits that it can bring. And um, that's summarized in these next two slides. Um, and we kind of break down the benefits to the, the investment that happens during construction and then the benefits over the, the 35 to 40 year life of the solar project. Um, so first, the, the, during construction, you're talking about a, a very large investment for a solar project. Um, the minimum investment would be about $170 million, 
Um, if we are able to do the full 210 megawatts, that would actually be closer to 200 or 220 million. Um, but in your application, you asked about the minimum investment. And so it, the minimum would be $168 million. And that's mostly in equipment, uh, food, fuel, that's aggregate. That's obviously the panels and the racking and the transformers for the substation. Um, and so that's the investment that would happen uh, at, at construction. And that also includes the labor to build the project. Um, we would expect to see about $550,000 in uh, a one-time infusion in uh, sales tax revenue and uh, rollback taxes that the county and the school district and the, the ESD would receive because the land that's uh, where the equipment is gone will be uh, losing the ag exemption. So that's a one-time infusion. I think, if I remember correctly, about 400 of that 550000 is the ag, the, the land coming in. Uh, out of ag uh, under the rollback taxes. Did y'all? How did y'all come up with that number? Did is, do you have a formula or something, or did you check with our district tax office to find out what the number would be? We have um, uh, Stephen involved and, and ran some of these numbers, but we also did a, a full report that has all those numbers in it, and the uh, the report is attached to the application. Okay. So I'd be happy for your appraiser to go through and make sure he agrees. You know, our our goal in all of this modeling is to be conservative. Uh, I don't want to be here saying, you know, promising something that's not going to happen. Uh, so the modeling is conservative, but I would love to have your appraiser look at it and, and see if he agrees. Um, but this is modeling that has been done by Cummings Westlake and by uh, the consultant that, that did the modeling and the report that it will be done. Thank you. Um, solar projects, uh, the construction phase involves a whole lot of activity and a whole lot of people. So the jobs that are involved in a solar project are predominantly during construction, so they're temporary, uh, but there would be a lot of folks involved in building the project during that year-long process. Uh, we estimate there will be anywhere from uh, around 300 directly employed uh, folks building the project, and then another 85 or so indirect jobs that would be created. Um, that's during the construction phase. We'll, we'll talk about the permanent jobs in a second when we get to operations. Um, and the idea is that, that we would like, it's in our best interest, and I think it's in the county's best interest to hire as many local folks as possible. Um, we don't know how many folks have the skills that are needed uh, and are available to, to do the work. So we, the plan for us is to have a job fair and to advertise locally so as many folks as possible can uh, participate in the construction. And there's a lot of different, there's a lot of gravel hauling for the roads, there's a lot of welding, there's land clearing, there's trenching for the collection lines. So there's a, a lot of opportunity there for that, that year-long construction. And then if we go to the next slide uh, and talk about the benefits uh, during operations, we've only modeled here the first 25 years. Um, most of us probably won't be around after that. Um, but the life of a solar project is considered to be in the 35 to 40 year range. And that really is driven by the life of the panel. The solar panels are guaranteed by the manufacturer for typically uh, at least 25 years, increasingly 30 years. And so 30 to 35 years is, is typically the minimum life of a solar project. Our leases typically run 40 years. And so um, that's, that's kind of the outer bounds that we've modeled the first 25 years here. So once the project is, is operational, and the improvements are on the ground and, and taxable to, to the local jurisdictions, um, there would be uh, close to $5 million in new tax revenue to the county uh, from the, the improvements in the ground. Now note there that that is assuming the abatement that we're requesting, which is a 10-year uh, abatement at 70% of the value of the improvements. Um, so even with that abatement, that would generate uh, $4.8 million in new revenue to the county. Uh, and as I've noted here at the bottom, that's with no services that need to be provided by the county. We don't need wastewater uh, or water service. Uh, so there's very little cost associated with that revenue for the county. The project um, is also uh, fully taxable for uh, with the school district. And we are in discussions with the school district about a special type of abatement that the school district can grant. And I'm hopeful that, that the school board will decide to do that. Uh, we're, we're in that process right now. But even with that abatement, the project would generate over $10 million in new revenue for Iola ISD. And that's in, in several buckets that so we can talk more about if you like. Um, but so there's new revenue for the school district. 
And then there's the, the annual spending, uh, mainly in repairs and maintenance and security, particularly grounds maintenance. Uh, and there would be uh, roughly $60 million over that 25-year period in annual spending that includes the payments to the landowners who are participating in the project. The jobs, once the project is up and running, uh, are very few. You know, one of the benefits of a solar project is there are very few moving parts. There's very little that can fail. Uh, the sun is free, and so the reason why solar, you're seeing more and more solar get built is because uh, the price of solar panels has come down so much that now solar is competitive with wind and natural gas, and that's why most of what you're seeing get built in, in today and in the next, well, foreseeable future will be those three technologies. But the flip side of that is that it does not take a lot of people to operate a solar project. So uh, we, there will be one new permanent job, and there will be several uh, part-time jobs equivalent of, of two additional full-time equivalents. Uh, but so the value proposition of the county, I don't want to uh, you know, make have any misunderstanding. The value proposition here is not long-term job creation in the county. It's about value of improvements in the ground, new tax revenue, uh, and the value of, of taking some of the land out of uh, the ag exemption, out of ag use, and uh, raising the tax revenue for those the, the land that's involved. Um, the other benefit, of course, is this is um, clean, emissions-free electricity uh, with no water use in the generation of electricity. The only water that's used uh, for a solar project, there will be some for dust control during construction. And then during operations, under normal conditions in this uh, part of the country, there's enough rain to keep the panels clean. But if we get into an extended drought uh, period, well, then we might need to truck in some water to clean the panels occasionally to keep the production uh, maximized. But otherwise, there's no water use. Um, solar is considered a passive use because there's no noise, there's no emissions, there's no dust, there's no odor, uh, there's very little light. Uh, the inverters will usually have a, a single uh, downward facing light. And once construction is done, there's not a lot of traffic coming in and out. So uh, I like to think of solar projects as good neighbors in the sense that once construction is done and they're up and running, uh, most people won't even know that it's there. Um, the, uh, the, in order for all this to happen, um, the reality is uh, we need a, a tax abatement with the county and we would uh, hope to be able to partner with you on that. The, the abatement, um, the, the reason why an abatement is needed, uh, and I want to take a minute to explain this uh, because it kind of has to do with the way the uh, electric, electricity markets are structured. And that is that the, electricity, the wholesale electricity market is highly competitive. I think you're seeing that in uh, the Gibbons Creek plant, which has announced retirement because it is such a competitive market with natural gas prices the way they are. Unless you can produce power uh, at the level that, that the market will accept, well then uh, your power is not competitive and your, you know, either your, your project won't get built um, or, or you're seeing you know, plants come offline. Uh, in order for a, a, a new plant to get built, you need a long-term contract with a buyer for the power for that facility. That's what makes the whole thing work economically or financially, is that we need to be able to go to the market and offer to sell electricity from this solar facility at a price that's competitive. And we're competing with solar projects in other parts of the state. We have a very good, uh, in fact, a nationally recognized transmission system, which does a good job of moving electricity around the state. But it also means that then projects that are built in other parts of the state where land is cheaper and where the solar resource is stronger uh, are our competitors. And so um, the, the reason why, and there's a map here on the next slide that we'll get to, um, so you might say, well then why do the project here? Why not do the project out where land is cheaper and, and the solar resource is stronger? Well, the third variable is that, that transmission system. Um, one of the things that you saw in the early days of the, the build out of the wind projects out in West Texas is that, that once the transmission lines get full, well, it doesn't matter how good your wind resource is, if you can't get your power to, to where it's consumed, then it's, uh, it causes a big problem financially. It's called curtailment when the grid says, no, you're going to have to shut down because there's no more space on the line. Uh, before we ever approached a landowner, we spent a lot of time analyzing the transmission system, and this is a great spot on the transmission system, both in terms of the capacity 
that can be put onto the system uh, here at that substation, but also in terms of the, the very low prospects for curtailment because it's close to the load, particularly in Houston, but also in, in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. So that's what, what brings us here. Um, on this next slide, just to help you understand that point, um, I've got a map, and the, the shading on that map is the solar resource in the state. And as you can see, the, in the eastern part of the state, um, it's a good solar resource, but the further west you go, the sunnier it is, um, and the, the stronger the solar resource. And the range there is about oh, about a 15% difference from the eastern part of the state to the western part of the state. Those green solar panels that are uh, there on the map, well, the, the star, of course, is, is uh, where the Blue Jay Solar Project would be located in Grimes County. And those other green panels are projects that have been uh, gotten those long-term contracts to sell power and or been financed in the last year or two. And I've listed there both the, the, the the difference in the solar resource as well as the cost of land. We're here in Grimes County, we're close enough to, to Houston and College Station that land prices are just higher. And as you go further west, you can see the land prices drop by anywhere from 50 to about 80%. And so you can see there kind of at a, at a glance, this is uh, what we're up against in terms of being able to uh, make the project work financially and get a long-term contract to sell the power, and that's why we're, we're here today asking for, for an abatement. Are these your companies? No. You're not associated with these at all? No. These are just other solar farms? These are competitors, yeah. These are just ones that, that are uh, out on the market that are other developers. Um, some of these, they're at various stages. These are all in, in late stage, I would call it. Some of them are in the late phase of development, but they've recently gotten a contract to sell the power. Uh, or some of them are under construction or recently operational, but no, we're not involved with these projects. This is really just to illustrate the point of, of who we're competing against to get those contracts. But there are more of these companies out there than what's indicated on the Texas Oh, plan. significantly more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is just a snapshot. Okay. Yeah, there, I mean, if, if you want to get a sense of how many solar projects are proposed today, the ERCOT, what's called the transmission queue, is public, and you can look and you will see it is uh, thousands of megawatts of proposed solar projects, uh, as well as wind and natural gas. Now, the reality is, if you go look at that, it'll be dizzying, but not all of those projects will get built. You know, a whole lot of projects get proposed, but for one reason or another, they don't make it across the finish line. These are ones that are now either at or very close to the finish line, and that's why I put it in. Um, I want to turn it over to Stephen. Um, this next slide kind of goes through the, the projections that we've done on on the revenue that uh, would be available to the county. Hello. Bring magnifying glasses for this. <laughs> <laughs> I got contact. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go over you know the numbers and talking with about the abatement. You know, as you can see here. First year, you know, we're estimating depending on the uh, the timeline of it being built, we think there'll be kind of a construction work in progress that very first year in zero, and then after that it'll be built in 2023. It'll come online on a full value. Um, kind of going from left to right, we've got the year, the year, the 25 years, the actual tax year, the value, what the taxes would be without an abatement. Now we've also added on what the taxes would be for ESD1, just to show that that would be bringing uh, revenue to them also. Um, we are proposing a 70-30 abatement, and this can be looked at one of two ways. You can either do a percentage abatement, or you can do a pilot payment, which we've done an equivalent of, and probably three or four years ago, a lot of the counties and other jurisdictions started going to the pilot payment because it is a number that is known. It will be like that for the next seven, eight, ten years, whatever the term of the abatement is, as opposed to a percentage abatement. You always have to wait to see what the value is, then multiply by the percentage, and that's the revenue or the, that you'll get for that year. And uh, another thing about the pilot payment is that those funds go outside of your rollback calculations. So you don't have to include those, and you can use them how you see fit. So that is another reason why the counties are opting for a pilot payment. So looking at that green box on the right where we have the 10-year abatement, taxable 30%, abated 70%, you 
you know, the tax will be about 1.1 million over the 10 years, and the abated would be about 2.6 million over the 10 years. And if we were to back into a pilot payment, that would be the 1.1 million divided by the megawatts, which is 210 or estimated 210, which would be about $536 a megawatt. And on the far right, you'll see that pilot payment of 112,000 a year that you would get for 10 years, no matter what the value is. Um, that's what we're proposing for the abatement. Uh, in the blue boxes below that, we talk about the ag exemption. You asked how we arrived at our numbers. We estimated the 1,500 acres. Uh, I did probably five or six or eight of the parcels and looked at what the average value of those acres were, and they were about $4,500. So we did the 1,500 times the 4,500, and that's the estimated increase in value of about 6.7 million. And with that increase at the tax rate, it's about $36,000 a year, and over the 25 years, it'll be about 900,000. For the rollback, we use the same, and starting last year, the, roll, the rollback used to be a five-year rollback at 7%, and in 19, they changed it to a three-year rollback at 5%. So you have rollbacks at 5%, 10%, 15%. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you add all those up, and that'll be a one-time injection of $118,000. <coughs> Kind of summing that all together is the gold box in the middle. Uh, pilot payments would be 1.1 million. The county, the taxes after the abatement would be 2.1 million. The land coming off ag is 900,000. The ag rollback is 118,000. And then we've also added in the ESD benefit of about 300,000. So about 4.6 million coming. His estimate had 4.8, and that's where the 222,000 comes in from year zero, and that's the construction work in progress, which would not be under abatement because the facility hasn't been built. So that's an estimate of value of what the project would be in a construction work in progress state. And that's over 20. That's over 25 years. Correct. 26, if you include year zero. 26. Use everybody. No, but you might give them a minute to absorb. Sure, sure. And let me know if you have any questions or want any clarifications. And auditors, if you have any questions, this is a good time for y'all to jump in. So the abatement years you're requesting are 10 years. A 10 year abatement. Okay, so underneath the 10 years um, up to the 25th or 26th year, that's the life of the. That's not the life. That's just that we did a 25 year life just to show. We could have done a 30 okay. and 35. So or that's 40. just, just you just showing. Just, we just cut it off at 25. I think okay. on the previous slide we just show 25 is a general thing that most counties like to see. Like, what is our 25 year projections? Mm -hmm. We could have done 30, 35, like he said, the panels. 35 40 years mm -hmm. don't know until you get there type of thing so it's just kind of a standard that we've done as a 25 year life to show the benefit so you're requesting 70 percent for the full 10 years correct that is, that is our, our request um, and then if we do the pilot payment, it would essentially be 100%, but we'd be giving you that 113000 on the side as a payment in lieu of taxes. When you met with Commissioner Mallet and myself and we were discussing, we were talking about the amount, you said, well, we might be able to go down to 65. Did you decide you can't go down to 65? Yeah, but, so the, that's actually in, uh, well, I've got another copy here because um, if y'all go to 65 I'd rather look at those numbers versus looking at the numbers at 70. okay and and so what that is is in on our meeting uh, uh Commissioner Mallard the judge uh asked us you know what what can you do for the county to try to ensure that we're getting the best deal possible and so I went back with our finance guy and and we sharpened our pencils and I think we could live with a 65% abatement over 10 years. We also modeled a seven-year version if the county prefers a shorter abatement <clears throat> period. Um, and so here, this this is the, the same slides that we sent uh, over to you, Judge, uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
and so the first slide is the same, 70%, and then the next two are the two different options uh, of a little bit. They, they, they put a, get the county about 200,000 more uh, in tax revenue Thank over the, the, the 10 year period. So the first one is a 65% uh, 10 year abatement, and the next one is a, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so one of those is the, the, the second page is a 10 year abatement at 65% and then the seven year schedule uh, starts at 100% and then uh, works down to 40% in, in year seven. So um, that is something that I think that we can live with and the project could still work. Uh, you know, from, from my perspective, my vantage point is to try to get this project on the footing, the best footing it can to get built. So the better, you know, the, the bigger abatement you can do, the better chance the project had of getting built. But we, we went ahead and sharpened the pencil, and I think we could live with this, so I, that is included here. So if you'd like to look at those numbers, Stephen, if you go over those, we'll do uh, as well. And the reason for being the 70 is because that's what was in our application, or is in our application, and that is what we proposed. But didn't want to muddy the water with a bunch of different scenarios. So, um, well, as long as you keep taking the request downward, that'd be okay. <laughs> Get it as muddy as you want. Right, right. Um, Quick it's, question. It's, sure. Okay, so on the last option that you gave, uh, the seven on year. the seven-year, mm -hmm. that's the, the terms, the difference in terms of uh, instead of 70, you've gone to 100, and then 90 and then 80. Yeah, we stepped it down 10% a year for seven years. And we can also, if you look at that uh, right column, the pilot payment, mm -hmm. plus the three years after, we there's a way to back into the pilot payment. There's a way to go forward and backwards. So if you guys want to keep it at kind of a 190, 80, 70, 60, 40, you know, type deal where you get the same money, that's one thing. If you want to do the percentages, um, again, if you want to try to do a pilot, that's a, a different scenario, but like I was saying earlier, the, the big um, bonus of that is those those monies go outside of your rollback calculations, which a lot of counties have. So to clarify that, what he's saying is that if you look at this, the green box on the right-hand side, uh, we're indifferent as to whether you do a, a say, the seven-year abatement that starts at 100 and uh, goes down 10% a year, and then the county would get the, the numbers in the left-hand green column. If you prefer to do the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes, instead of getting that left-hand column, you would get the, the payments in that, uh, the column just to the right of that, the 113,000 roughly a year. And so we're indifferent to those. Um, most counties prefer that, like, like uh, Stephen said, because that money comes in outside of the rollback calculation. But to us, it makes no difference. And one other little note on the seven year, if you look at the pilot payment plus the three years after, the three years after are out of abatement, but I included them because if I didn't, it looked like this scenario was far below than what you guys would get. It didn't look good on paper, so that's why I added it in. So you see the 797, 692 under the taxable. Well, I'm sorry, are you on? The seven, one, the, the seven year. The seven year, the last page. Yes. Under the, in the, the bigger green box, under the taxable, you'll see the 797, 692. Right. So that'll be what the pilot payment is based on, or that'll be the estimated taxes over those seven years. If you go to the column to the right where it says pilot payment plus three years after, I added in the three years after because if you didn't, it may, you, it looked like you only got 797 because it's only a seven year compared to our. 10 year models and it, it threw off the number. So I wanted to okay. true it up so it, you can kind of see what you're getting. That's right. Yeah. So. Commissioner Walker, Commissioner Dobianski, Commissioner Mallett, uh, I will confess to the 
world about us. I have not been through a, an abatement discussion with the company on behalf of the court before. I don't know if any of y'all have. Commissioner Cox, since I haven't, I don't guess you have either. Uh, not to say you don't have any uh, appropriate questions, but what are some of the questions or concerns that y'all might have on abatements that have been issued in the past? And also, Mr. Fultz, our county attorney, uh, I would ask for any concerns or comments that you have, and auditors likewise. So, I'll be happy to speak up. Um, certainly, a, abatement is a useful tool that you have to have companies come into the county and. It's at your discretion to decide the terms of the abatement, the guidelines that are proposed that come with the application or just that, their guidelines. Um, there is, with an abatement, the requirement that you designate a reinvestment zone. As I spoke with Commissioner Cox uh, outside today, I'm not familiar with the impact of the designation of 1,500 acres as a reinvestment zone. Obviously, you would want to be convinced the project was going to happen before you went off designating 1,500 1, acres as anything. But I think you want to hear from the appraisal district what impact that may have long term and short term to designate those that many acres as a reinvestment zone. I would also offer to you that the court, at some point in the past, be, uh, being concerned about the long term nature of an abatement, uh, was asked uh, or considered a 381 grant under Chapter 381 Local Government Code. The policy that we wrote with regard to that is for a five-year uh, versus a 10-year. And the uh, scheme or mechanism that we used in that process was to do a uh, reimbursement of the taxes paid versus tinkering with the actual taxes that will be paid. The full amount was paid to the county. The county then reimbursed X percent of the taxes that had been paid to the county. So those things are on the table. Um, I can't tell you uh, what's best for as far as, far as policy is concerned. Um, and, and I mean, I can tell you my thoughts on it, but uh, you know, I'd rather do that privately if you care about my thoughts on it. But as far as the legal aspect, I would say to you, there is provision in our uh, guidelines that there is a committee that's to assemble, that's to consider this. It seems to me any and all of you could be uh, party to that discussion assuming three or more won't want to do that, then obviously you need to post that notice. Uh, I would want to hear from Mr. McNally about uh, his perspective on it. Um, but when you have that policy or that committee that's going to consider this, obviously they would want to talk with the appraisal district, confirm the numbers, and also discuss what the impacts are of designating that many acres as a reinvestment zone. Okay. Doctors, any previous experiences or comments or thoughts? I, uh, I remember when <clears throat> the discussion came up of having a shorter period for abatements because 10 years is an awfully long time, <laughs> you know, True. when it comes to your budgets. And so I agree with um, what uh, Mr. Fultz said that, you know, at one point in time we did have a policy where we would prefer the five-year. Mm -hmm. Okay. He also spoke of the uh, committee. I had the opportunity to serve on the committee, I guess it's been uh, five, six years ago now, when we had a company wanting to come in and we had the uh, a representative from the chamber, uh, representatives from the financial institutions on that committee. Industrial uh, Park. Industrial Park Factors. and also uh, the appraisal office. We met with the company, listened to the proposal, and then we gave, gave a counter offer to the company at that time. And that's Did the it. company ultimately get an abatement? No, no. because they, they chose to. We offered them an abatement here, but they chose to go to Waller County. They were closer to two. Um, 2-9. Yes. The location oh, was okay. important to that. I mean, 249 had not been built out. Yeah. So they were concerned about um, getting the product to the uh, consumer faster. But I, I, I discussed this project yesterday with Mr. McNally. I would defer to him right now and uh, as our economic development director uh, to uh, hear 
what your concerns are. Well, I don't think there are any reporting concerns on this, right? I mean, whatever your projections are, there's there's no reporting to follow up to make sure that you're um, you're hitting a limit. Can we request that you, for instance, have a particular output every year? You're saying 200 megawatts. Uh -huh. Will you have any? Will we have any recourse if your output is less than you project, or if you're not able to secure a you, contract? Let me answer. Are you asking for a for a value? Yes. Okay. So for solar in Texas, it is a statute that it is on a ten year life cost. So we can't bring in income. We can't bring in market or anything like that. So it is on a cost. So whatever we put in the ground will be put on a ten year life, and it won't matter if they produce one megawatt or two hundred megawatts. It'll be that. Sorry, that's what you're. Yes. It's it's not like a you know, a Gibbons Creek or some other facilities where you know, hey, our income's cut in half. We need an adjustment for this. It's state mandated. It has to be done on the cost approach. So, there are no other adjustments, other obsolescence that can be given. And uh, and then there are some provisions in the, uh, in the abatement plan with regards to minimum employment that would bring to the county. Right. And that's something we'd have to discuss. That have to be modified because this certainly doesn't meet yeah. that. Right. Yeah. I've got a comment on that too. So there's actually two variances that we'll we need to either ask for or have a variance for. The first one is is your guidelines criteria actually don't allow for renewable generation. Any generation. Any gener any generation, which I think obviously we want to get that changed because I think not only is it good for, for this, but other developers that are looking around that are able to access your guidelines and criteria online, they may look and say, well, they don't like renewables, we're gonna go on to the next county. Whereas if you put it in there that you are open to it, you might have a lot more of these people coming in saying, hey, we'd like to talk to you about this. And the other variance is on the jobs. And I think, you know, I think you guys require 10 and instead of 15, um, instead of actually changing the guidelines criteria, we ask for a waiver or a variance and a letter, and then it gets granted as opposed to actually redoing your guidelines criteria. And commissioner, if I could just speak on that, You're, they are just guidelines, but keep in mind that you have due process, equal protection concerns as a governmental body. You make a decision for one entity, then you need to be willing to be consistent with other entities. That's the, it, that issue. And then Mr. McNally raised another. Some folks may have a bad taste in their mouths about a pilot a payment in lieu of taxes. I want to be sure that we're clear this is apples and oranges to what TMPA was paying. TMPA was given the ability to condemn. They also were exempt from ad valorem taxes. Um, there was a lawsuit in the 70s because the county was not going to receive any ad valorems and the settlement was that they would make a payment in lieu of taxes. It was calculated on a formula using uh, kilowatts generated, which is similar to what we're talking about here. You may be familiar that that number uh, drifted down, downward uh, more and more, and then finally disappeared. Um, same kind of theory as to the formula here that's, that's arrived at, but I want to be sure that we're talking apples and oranges, something totally different. What, if anybody's familiar or remembers that payment in lieu of taxes and has you know some bad taste in your mouth about that. And, and I would to dovetail into his thing. Our pilot payment is not based on production. It's based on the actual size of the project. So the size will never change, so meaning the pilot payment will change. Which is an important distinction. I wasn't yeah. aware of that about the TMBA facility, but, but the one that we're proposing, uh, like Stephen said, is based on capacity. So once the project is built, the capacity will not change. If it's 190 megawatts or 200 megawatts or 210 megawatts, the, the pilot would be based on that number, which would not change. That's different than a number that's based on the number of megawatt hours or kilowatt hours, because that number will change. But the idea is to design this to give the county certainty about the revenue stream that would not be fluctuating based on you know what years there was um, more sunshine than others. I'm sure y'all have checked to make sure that this is not in the um, proposed route of the high-speed rail. Correct. Okay. We're several miles uh, south and west of that. And then uh, the other things that we want to, may want to consider is um, the development that's expected along Highway 30 and 
proximity of this project to that development. And then um, also, this is not the only solar company that's interested in building in Grimes County. And so, not that you have to apply the same rules to every company, but there is a little, I don't know, some people may think that you're setting a precedent by whatever you decide to do as a, as a body. Did we have a couple of landowners that are here? If you don't mind, sir, would you come to the podium, identify yourself, and then share some of your thoughts or comments? Yes, sir. I'm Mark Dudley. Um, I live in College Station. I have a construction company on Highway 30, Dudley Construction, landowner in Grimes County. Family's been in Grimes County forever. Um, so why do you live up? Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my dad was the coach in Iola in 60, from 65 to 68, and he got crosswise with the school board member, and we went to Brian to, to coach over in Brian. That's well, Lord, forgive and forget, you can move back. Uh, I, I have a cabin over in Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, these guys have been great to work with. Uh, Never once did I hear eminent domain or even the, the, the thought of that they might have eminent domain. And I would have bristled if I had heard it. So I, I know that was a concern. I'm glad that is a concern of yours. And uh, it, it didn't occur. This area, to put a finer point on it, we've talked about it being near Iola. It's actually an old town site. It's Mesa. And it was called me. It's Mesa, what it should be, because it was flat. It was largely treeless. And so the early settlers coming out of the southeast were traveling along the La Bahia Trail, which it left from Anderson, going to Bidas, took you right through this area. And here was a big flat plain, uh, and they said, man, this is a great place to grow cotton. In fact, my brother's place, we call it the Big Prairie, because it is so flat and largely treeless. And so uh, I think it's very conducive to a solar farm. And that's, uh, I think the proximity to Houston has a lot to do with it. The fact that we have this gigantic new high voltage transmission line that's right next to, to uh, well, actually it's part of, it's on some of our property and runs next to it, uh, some of our property. So all those things have worked to our favor. And well, we've had so many uh, gas pipelines oil pipelines, uh, high voltage transmission lines. Finally, we have something that really, I think, will be an asset to us. So we're, we're very much hopeful that uh, this is accepted uh, and, can, and can move forward. I do have one thing I want to talk to you about that I think might help everybody, but uh, these guys they're from Austin. They're a little different than us. They're not landowners. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and in Austin, they like to keep it weird. We yes. Uh, you know, they, they talked about 16 landowners and uh, a gross area of 2,000 acres that would then come down to about 1,500 acres of uh, solar farm. And largely, the 500 acres that's not being used is not being used because it's lands that are considered wetlands and previously any land that uh, held water for any short period of time would be considered a wetland and I've got uh, areas on my property that they consider as wetlands and I, I'm, I was about to start feeding hay in September when we started getting these rains in early September uh, uh, I can't dig a post hole more than six inches deep right now without putting great effort into it, but somehow it's considered a wetland. But uh, President Trump in January repealed that law. And so now a wetland is only a wetland if it borders a coastal area or a large body of water. So these 500 acres that you guys are losing the revenue on, these guys are losing the revenue on, I'm losing the revenue on, I hope you can convince them to include those uh, uh, lands that are no longer considered wetlands under the current uh, law that is in place. So uh, that's pretty much what I, I wanted to say, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Mr. Dudley, could I ask, you have land 
do you mind sharing how much you're leasing? And if you do, don't you don't have to. Four hundred acres. Four hundred acres. Now, are those four hundred acres that you have leased are they surrounded by other landowners that are leasing, or are they people that are going to walk out with their cup of coffee one morning and say, "What the heck's going on next door?" Largely, all the landowners in the area are are leasing. Now, uh, I I have some relatives that uh, they're leasing some of their land and keeping some of their land, but. They're going, they're, they're, that's their choice, and they're choosing to do some and not do some. Uh, at, at, some at some point, though, you'll hit that boundary where these people aren't leasing and these people are, so I'm just wondering what's the, yeah. I mean, we're concerned about how the 16 landowners would be treated by this company, but I think the court is all, well, I'll speak for myself. I'm concerned about the other landowners that might not have the opportunity to participate in this or want to participate in this, what's going to be their reaction? Right. I can't think of a single landowner that borders me that has any issue with this. They're either participating or um, they're choosing not to, but it's not because they don't want to see a solar farm there. Okay. I, I did go over to Beat Eyes and look at that solar farm. Um, and to me, it didn't seem intrusive. I thought it was well kept. I didn't see a lot of reflection going uh, back and forth because I, I have some land too that I'm not putting into it that's going to be next next to it. So um, I, I understand your point. I don't think it's overly obtrusive. obtrusive. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank uh, you. Commissioners, thank any you. other comments for Mr. Dowd? Thank you. Appreciate any, it. Any other landowner here that? might want to speak or share a comment this is a yes ma'am if you don't mind coming to the podium and identifying yourself uh, my name is jennifer vasquez and i like mr Dove here have land connected and we have our family in general has been about 415 acres mm -hmm. uh, of course we live right there in the area and the way that these uh, gentlemen work with us is to protect where we live, you know, by putting up barriers to where we don't have to look at, if we don't want to look at these, uh, the solar systems, you know, you know, the panels and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, as Mr. Dovey said, most of the people around us had decided to go into it. We did not put all of ours in it, but uh, many of my family members have, and don't feel threatened by what we'll have to see. Okay. Just want to say that. What type of area? As far as where? Or no, what type of ba ba barrier? You oh, barrier? Mm -hmm. More uh, a natural barrier. Uh, shrubs, uh, trees like, you know, that are going to be there continuously. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to say or anyone else have questions to add? Yes, sir. Uh, I just had a question on the, the preliminary work. The, uh, Johnny, so we make sure we get you on camera for the world to see. Would you come to the podium? And sure. For those that might not know, at least introduce yourself and your position. I'm Johnny McNally with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm the Executive Director, and I also do economic development for Grimes County. And I had a question about the regulatory process building up, leading into the construction. My uh, impression was that it was a, a longer process than would allow you to go live by May of 2022. So that's my question. Sure. Um, well, and there are a couple things that have come up that I'd be happy to um, elaborate on. And, and uh, let me give you a copy of this. There's a copy of the map. You had asked about proximity to Highway 30, and the project is on the other now. So I do have a copy. And let me also comment first on a. a uh, question that, that you had, Commissioner Walker, which is the, the screening. Um, many landowners that are participating in the project uh, ask that we we put a, a, install a barrier if in some place that they particularly you know, are sensitive to it, maybe a house, or in some cases a neighbor in the house, and the landowner asks that we include in our contract that we will install a natural barrier, as, as Jennifer said, and it's, uh, it's a, a row of, of low-growing evergreens uh, that you know the the, height, the maximum height of the panels, depending on which which model we use, is anywhere from 10 to 12 feet. 
So you plant a row of uh, trees, evergreen trees, that grow up to about that height, so that once they're grown, well, they effectively block the view of the panels. And that's something that we've already agreed to in a number of places. As Mark said, there aren't a lot of, of houses that are nearby the, the parts of the area where the, the panels will be, but in, in those spaces where there are, we've already agreed and are happy to install that, that type of natural barrier. And as we go through this process, if, if there are other folks nearby, I've, I've done my best to try to visit with everybody and give everybody an opportunity to participate. But if there's somebody that hasn't heard about it, feel free to refer them to me and I'm happy to sit down with them and talk about any concerns they have and, and we can install more of that type of natural barrier for if there are nearby landowners that have to um, To your question, um, regulatory, uh, keep in mind that this now uh, project is, is about three years in the making. So um, you're right, if we were just starting today, we would not be able to start construction you know, next summer and be up and running in, in May of 2022. This is a process that started about three years ago. So there's a very long process that we have to go through to be able to put our power on the transmission system, and that culminates in agreement that we signed with Brazos Electric, and that's regulated by ERCOT, uh, the, the operator of the grid, and that's a Oh, anywhere from a one and a half to a, to a two and a half or three year process, and we are just about finished with that process. Um, there's a number of different studies that we have to do to make sure there isn't, say, endangered species habitat in the project area. Most of that survey work has been done, uh, including the locations of wetlands and floodplains. All of those are, are things that we do to determine the feasibility of a project to begin with, uh, as well as then the location of where the equipment can go. So uh, you're right, it is a process. Um, but it's not one that's starting today, it's one that started several years ago. We just don't, we don't want to take the time of the court before we have, we're far enough along to know that the project is feasible before we go and, and ask for an abatement uh, from the county or from the school district. Okay. I have two questions. One for Commissioner Mallet, since the other, or one of the solar farms, and I'm not sure how many solar farms we have in Grimes County, but I do know the b area. Uh, do you know how large that farm is? I don't remember how many It is two megawatts. Two megawatts. Two acres. One hundredth of the size of this one. Yeah. yeah. So what is it, two acres? I think two megawatts. No, I, th I think it's... Yep. I think it's okay, I don't, looks like I don't speak electric, so you have to speak... <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's... Yeah, it I thought it was 20 10. acres, yeah, which, is, oh, which is about two okay. megawatts. So it's a small company, but I don't... Do how size long has that been there? Size of the plant, or size of the well, about two... Okay, so it, it was in mid south. So they put that in, but they didn't come through on an abatement or anything like no, that. Of course, they have, I guess, a different yeah, they had a card. grant or uh, they sold blocks of it or something like that. Because okay. I haven't heard much uproar about that facility being there or landowners that are beside it complaining about it. I, I haven't got that. I don't know. Have you? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dudley. You brought something to my attention in your comment. You talked about the Mesa Township site. Yes, sir. Uh, have you all had any issues with the historical commission, or do you have any historical uh, sites on that land, or cemeteries, or Indian mounds? We do have one historical log cabin. It's got a historical marker on it. Yes, sir. Uh, Matthew Caldwell, his daughter, Margaret Caldwell, uh, built a log cabin there in 1848 and uh, lived there the rest of her life, married into my family. So they're going around, building around the cabin site. Would, would there be access to that yes, facility? Yes, there okay. would be access to the okay. site. Stephen, yes. I had a question about sure. the abatement. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to make sure I'm understanding the graph that you sure. gave us. Um, this is the years with no abatement, right? Correct. This would be the taxable amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're basing it upon uh, 0 0.530261. Current, well, I guess the 2019 tax rate. Okay, so would it still be on the uh, 2019 or the 20? Every, well, so it depends. If we do the percentage abatement, the whatever the tax rate is that year, if it goes to 50 cents or it goes to 65 cents, it will move with that. With the pilot payment, it's no matter, it doesn't matter whether the, it's, it's static. It doesn't matter whether the tax rate goes up or down. So if our tax rate changed this year, uh, like it went down, would this graph need redoing to, yeah, to I mean, give us Yeah, what did it go down to? 
You said a penny or? It went down to five to nine. six. No, so yeah, one, one tenth of a penny mm -hmm. difference, which I don't think will make for this purpose. But yes. Hey, we did a tax reduction. Give us That's credit. Hey, I'm trying to put it out there. You're going to be running for office. You live in Austin. He lives in Houston. Yeah, 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 Houston. Okay, so, so the, the graph to the side, you have your 10-year abatement amount mm -hmm. and what's abated at the 70%, and then the pilot is just a little, Correct. just a little That's graph. That's the equivalent. So okay. if you notice at the bottom of that white one, it's 1125. Mm -hmm. And if you go over two over to the left, that's 1125. Mm -hmm. So you're getting the same money in the 10 mm -hmm. years. It's just this one is spread evenly over 10 years as opposed to getting it more up front right. and then less at the end because you're doing it based on the value which depreciates. Okay. Um, I can't tell by looking at the map here. The print's kind of small. How many... Um, County roads would the project impact? Uh, that's a good question. I'd have to go count them up. Um, four, 164, 165, 127, 162, 162. I, I could get you that list. And that, that's actually something else that, that I think I would put in a second category that we would need to do either along with abatement or, or shortly after is a, a simple road use agreement um, that would allow us to run the buried electrical cables under your roads um, and we would agree to to of course repair them after we're finished with construction um, but and I can get you that list of the roads that would be impacted. That, that man leaning against the wall there under the map <laughs> is is somebody that you do need to have conversation with sooner than later he's uh, our road and bridge engineer Mr. Harry Walker so Great. That's a good question, Commissioner Cox. Uh, just one more along those lines. Do you anticipate having overweight loads going on the road? Uh, I mean, the, yeah, the equipment that we'll be carrying in, the, the heaviest thing will be the, the transformer for the, the substation. You know, the panel tracks are not that heavy, but there will be truckloads of them. So I, I could get you the anticipated weight of the trucks that would be going sure. to put in. Yeah. The, the, the heaviest one would be the transformer and there's only one of those. Um, that transformers are, there's already transformers there. Well, it's been hauled in before. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's, well, there's a couple of different things. The inverters that are scattered around the project have a small transformer, but those are not like the big heavy ones. The, the big one is at the existing substation, the Iowa substation. So that one's existing. We wouldn't be hauling that one in. These would just be the, the small ones that are coming in. Uh, along with the inverters. <clears throat> well, we, we, if we know the project were to take place and we're coming in, we have a process where we'll picture the roads before you start work and we'll picture the roads in between and after and then of course y'all would be responsible for getting to, getting the roads back to light condition. So. We would fully expect that and we're happy to do that. This is a workshop, yes. I have a couple of questions. Would you come up to the podium and Marianne, would you introduce yourself? I'm Marianne Waters, tax assessor collector here in Grimes County. Um, first question I have, is any of this energy going to be provided to the residents of Grimes County? Yes? Uh, good question. I'll answer it. It's kind of a, a complicated answer, but okay. yes. Number two, what happens at the end of this 35, 40 year life? What happens to the plan at that time? Great. Two great questions. So um, the first one, uh, where will the power be consumed? Uh, and there's kind of two parts to that answer. Electricity, once it goes on into that substation, it flows like water to any, any points of consumption. So that will be area houses, that will be schools, that will be this building, uh, because the electricity will flow first to where there were the closest points that are consumed and then work its way out. That's, that's basically the physical answer. Um, the legal answer or the, the financial answer is also that we will be signing a contract with someone who will agree to consume the same amount of megawatts that are produced by this project. So, for example, one of the wind projects that I developed over in uh, Mills County um, and Comanche County, Walmart signed a contract to buy all of the power from that facility. 
Motors is buying the power from the facility, a, a different wind project, biochemical. So there will be somebody who signs a contract to contractually uh, consume that same amount of energy. But the reality is the electrons that Walmart or Dow uses are not necessarily the electrons that are produced at this facility. Those will flow to wherever they are uh, the closest points of consumption. Um, that's number one. And uh, the second one, I'm glad you asked about decommissioning. So um, at the end of the life of the project, every one of our lease agreements uh, obligates us to remove all of the equipment. Um, basically, you just deconstruct the, the project in reverse, remove the panels, remove the racks, pull the pilings out of the ground, um, remove the, pad, the, the pads for the inverters, remove the inverters, um, the collection yard, that equipment that's on the surface just comes up in reverse order and then the land uh, is reseeded uh, and it goes right back to, to you know, grazing or, or whatever the landowner wants. The only thing that, that could stay under our leases is any cables that are buried deeper than three feet in the ground uh, because generally they're below plow depth, they're below anything that would disturb and so those would stay, but everything else comes up as a contractual obligation. When you say your cables are underground, how far underground are you speaking? Of? A minimum of three feet, and uh, sometimes it depends on the landowner and the agreement. Some, sometimes we bury them, uh, they're buried at least three feet. Typically, they would be between three feet and four feet. Um, if we're having to, to bore under, say, a wetland or uh, a pipeline or something, then they may go deeper than that. That would depend on the specific case, but uh, the, the if you're just walking across the field, they wouldn't be less than three feet from the ground. And I'm not saying this to be funny, but we do have feral hogs in the area, and today the ground can be flat, and tomorrow you can have an 18-inch hole in there. Is that, is that something that y'all consider or an issue? Um, I've not heard of a pig digging down three feet. I yeah. have seen where a pig is dug down three foot. Really? Yeah. Well, unless you want to use this as a, a feral hog mitigation strategy, then I think we will then need to take a look at that. Well, I, I mean, again, I'm not saying this to be funny or anything, but there is a serious hog problem in our county, and it's not getting better. Uh, and it's one of the arguments we have with Texas Central Rail. They're going to be in a protected zone where nothing can get in to bother their trains, and that's BS. So. Uh, <laughs> Well, so that, that's a good point. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a hunter myself and, and hunt hogs, and I've, I've never seen one dig that deep down. But if, if it's different here in Grimes County, we will certainly, all that will go into the design of the facility, including the depth. The, the main thing that determines the depths of the line, in addition to any sort of barriers from the surface, are the soil conditions, which uh, determine the thermal and electrical resistivity of the soils, which determines the, the thickness and the materials of the insulation. Uh, but we would certainly uh, consider that. Now, in terms of the surface, all of the equipment will be fenced. So there will be no point at which a feral hog, uh, a hog could get into, you know, the, the panel area. But Can we have that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> they will dig underneath the fence, I promise you. Are there well, any environmental concerns such as, uh, are there any... Uh, while while not wildlife but uh, plants that may be disturbed uh, that grows in the fields well there, there certainly will the the vegetation you know the, this area is mostly grazing so there's not a lot of vegetation there is some um, and in areas that are that are where there are trees that, that are in part of the area where we put uh, put solar panels we will be clearing those trees um, there, you know, there's different types of vegetation that one of the, the steps that we go through is do an extensive study of, of any types of habitat and vegetation. That's, that's what and I to know. Do you have to do that and does that have to be reported to the state? Uh, no, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be reported to the state. If there's, a, if there's a federal nexus, well, then you can get into federal regulations. There's no state regulation that requires that. Okay. That's something that we do as, as developers because we want to make sure that, that we know what's out there. And then if you, if you say, encounter habitat for a federally listed species, well, then you have to report that, and there are certain steps that you have to go through. Okay. Um, but that's, that's really not the case here. 
We do have a we do have endangered species in the Navasota Ladies Tress. Are you familiar with that plant? Mm -hmm. And it, it grows in the bottomlands and creek areas. Uh, it is uh, on, on the federal list, I believe. Of the 300 employees that you will hire initially, will you be giving priority to those that are applying that actually live in Grimes County? Yes, we would, you know, it's in our best interest, I think, as well as the county, is that as many local folks as possible take those jobs. So we will do everything we can from a local job fair to advertising locally. Um, I just don't yet know how many qualified, available folks there will be. You know, if somebody works in construction, has construction experience, it may be that he or she already has a job somewhere and is not going to drop that to do this for, you know, 10 months. Um, but it's, it's certainly we will make the commitment to do everything we can to hire as many local folks as possible. Uh, I think it says that it has to be 50% of new or retained positions must be held by Grimes County residents. That's the waiver they're asking you to uh, review. Yeah, that's right. As Stephen mentioned, there, there are two provisions in your current guidelines um, that we would need a waiver from. One is the, the number of jobs uh, created, and, and that includes the, the share that would be local. I, I hope there are 50% that are available and, and have the background to be able to do this. I just don't know that, so we wouldn't be able to commit to that. And the second one is the requirement or the, the uh, provision that makes any power generation facility ineligible for abatement. There is a provision in there that says that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't have it in front of me, but... Uh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll look at that. And you did say this is going to be a tracking panels versus the fixed panels, is that correct? I would say it's 75% likely that it's the tracking panels and not the, the fixed hill. As those costs have come down, you produce more electricity, right. your equipment costs are a little higher, we haven't yet finalized equipment selections, but that's what I anticipate will be the case. So if you're going to have tilt panels as opposed to stationary, I don't know what the correct terminology is, mm -hmm. and you have people adjacent to the property um, that may build structures on the property, are those tilt panels going to have an impact? Or if they build the structure before you put your tilts on there, what do you do if that has a negative impact on the people next door to it? You mean in terms of casting a shadow on the panels? Or are you or asking reflection, about anything, any negative impact, or what could be considered a negative? Well, um, yeah, I mean the, the the panels themselves don't look really any different than the fixed tilt. So if it's a if it's a view shed issue, if somebody just doesn't like the look of them, you know that that's in the category of I'm happy to visit with them and we can plant a row of, of trees to block the view. Um, glare is not really an issue with solar panels. There, there are lots of studies that have been done. The whole point of the solar panel is to absorb uh, as much radiation as possible, irradiance I mean. Um, and so they absorb over 98% of the irradiance that hits them. So glare is, is really not an issue. But And somebody would have to build a very tall structure for it to be tall enough to say cast a shadow and solve the problem for us. But if it's a, if it's a uh, you know, a concern of, of looking at the solar panels, whether they're fixed tilt or, or the tracking type, you know, we're, we're always happy to visit with folks and you know, installing that screen vegetation is something that we're always open to. Any other questions? Any other comments? <laughs> Hearing none, uh, we'll go to the third item on the agenda. Motion, motion to adjourn. Second. I have a motion to adjourn from Commissioner Gobianski. Second. I have a second from Commissioner Walker. Further discussion, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned. It's 10 20. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.